guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. And uh, when you think about Palm Sunday, this is what it's all about. Think about it. This was the final week. If we were in the days of Jesus, today would have been the last seven days of Jesus being on the earth. On Palm Sunday, Jesus is now entering into Jerusalem on this awesome donkey. Can you imagine how lucky that donkey was to be able to carry our Lord and Savior? You know what I'm saying? And so, but that's no different than us. When you have Christ in your life, you're carrying Jesus in you. And so we know that the reason they call it Palm Sunday is because as he was entering Jerusalem to declare that he would give us victory, right? Palm Sunday was his declaration saying, hey, listen, I'm going to conquer death, hell, and the grave. And he begins to tell people, that's like me looking at you, Anush, and saying, hey, listen, your problem that you're going through right now, guess what? By next Sunday, man, it is dealt with, done with, you're awesome. You'd be like, oh, my God. And if it would happen, right? You'd be like, oh, my Lord. And so that's what Jesus came to do. And so people were just honoring Jesus as he's entering Jerusalem. And everyone starts bringing out palm, uh, palms from palm trees. And they start laying them down. And, and he's coming. And they all start singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be our Savior, Hosanna. And there was something that was powerful about it. You know what, what's even more powerful? On this same week, there was a Jewish tradition where they, they celebrated this 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 ceremony called Nissan. Not like the vehicle Nissan, but you know what I mean. And, and they didn't like it. You know, the religious people were so ticked because now Jesus is invading on their celebration week. But one thing I love about God, one thing I love about Jesus is that God so loved the world that he sent his son not only to save us, but you know what he did? He came to break the tradition of man. And so these men, these Pharisees, man, they were so ticked off that Jesus was getting more attention than their religion. How many many really believe here today that people are so sick and tired of religion? People are tired of it. Jesus is beyond religion. And so Jesus walks in in their, in their game, and, and they're upset, and, and they're angry, and they're just like, man, what, what is he doing? But check this out. At some point, they finally realize that, you know what? Man, our tradition, we suck. Like, there's no life in this. And they started talking amongst themselves. Uh, I encourage you, if you go home today and, and after this service, read John chapter 12. It talks about all of the entry of Jesus during this Palm Sunday that is today, the last seven days of Jesus on planet Earth, which is pretty amazing. But look at what the Pharisees start discussing among themselves. Can you guys put up my first scripture? John 12, 19, look. So the Pharisees said to one another, so they're all talking amongst each other like, dude, this Jesus, man. What, in, what are we going to do? And so they, said, so, so they said to one another, this isn't getting us what? This is the perfect week because there are people that, that, that literally serve religion, but it's not getting them anywhere. There's so many people that are worshiping dead gods, meaning idols. And so these Pharisees are realizing that, listen, man, this isn't getting us anywhere. This tradition of man, this, the, the, this Nissan that we are celebrating, man, nobody even cares anymore. And don't you know that we live in a world now today where more people are running away from religion, but they're also running into the trap of the enemy, and then they're being bound and lost and broken. But that's our opportunity. Because guess what? This week is also known starting today, and this is what Jesus got the ball rolling in. It's called Passion Week. That's where that whole term came, Passion of Christ. This is the week of Passion of Christ. This is the week where you and I make a decision to be hooked on the things that Jesus is hooked on. And look what they said. Look how the what? Whole world. I, I thought to myself when I read this, I thought, why didn't it say, and look at all Jerusalem? Look at all Jerusalem is following him. No. Man, the Pharisees themselves said, man, look, the whole world is following him. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful. That just shows you that Jesus was so relatable. Jesus was someone that was literally just breaking the tradition of men. He was 
literally conquering the law, the law that man could not hold, the Ten Commandments that we all keep failing in, right? But Jesus came and he went ahead and obliterated that law that we continually failed in. And he said, you know what? I need, to, I need to show them that forgiveness comes through me. And so the Pharisees themselves are like, man, you know what? We're not getting anywhere with this message that we're bringing. But look at, look at him. The whole world is following him. But the question is, but are you following him? Because Jesus said this, his first statement to his disciples was, follow me and I will make you, follow me and I will make you. So here's the question for you today. Well, if you are following him, then you're obviously fishing. However, if you're not fishing, then maybe you're not what? Following. It's the first thing he said. He said, come with me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. His last words were, go fish, right before going to the Father. And so Jesus is, is so amazing and he's so relatable that 2,000 years later, you know what, without us, without our, without our cultures that we constantly keep, you know what, changing the cycle of cultures in, in this world, Jesus is so relevant that 2,000 years later, people all over the whole world are still wanting to know about him. And this is Passion Week. This is the week where you say, you know what? Okay, maybe from January through March, man, I have not reached one person. I haven't shared my faith with anyone. But it's time for me to go fishing. It's time for me to start being uh, uh, passionate about what God's passionate about. And he's passionate about souls. Jesus said, I fish for men. He fishes for you and I. When I think about just Jesus saying, you know what, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He literally was sent by God the Father because God loved us so much that he sent his son to go fishing. He literally sent his son to fish for the world. And then Jesus, then once he started training up his disciples, he says, now you go fish for them. Think about the person who fished you. Last weekend I shared my testimony. How one guy, if there wasn't a Larry... There wouldn't be a Mauricio today. One man in the workplace for two years just shared Jesus with me, shared, shared, shared. He did not quit. He did not stop. I wanted nothing to do with God, but he just kept going. He kept casting. He kept casting his line. He kept casting his love. He kept casting patience, kindness, goodness. He just kept casting and casting away. And then finally at some point, I needed a breakthrough. I needed God. And, then, and then, then I get radically saved and I turn my life to God. And you know what I do? I start serving him with all my life. And who would say that 20 years later I would still be walking with Christ, winning souls, changing lives. Without a Larry, there wouldn't even be a youth here today. God needs you. God needs us. He wants everyone fishing. It's his big idea. Everybody say Passion Week. Passion week. And so look at this. Here's a fun fact, and if you're a note taker, you can download our app, or if you already have our app, uh, I have my notes there. Here's a fun fact. Guys, put it up there. Come on. Fun fact. Jesus met 132 times one-on-one -on -one with people. Isn't that amazing? They, ch listen, now, we know the Jesus that always spoke to multitudes, but it is, it is fact that Jesus sat with 132 people within a three and a half year span. In three and a half years of his life on earth, he sat one on one with people and ministered to them, loved them. We're not talking about sitting down only with good people. I mean, Jesus spent most of his time meeting with people that were far away from God. He met with tax collectors. And I mean, these are these were some pretty wicked men. They were always stealing from people, robbing people. Man, he met with killers. He met with the worst of the worst. I mean, he would even connect with people that were demon-possessed. And all of a sudden, when Jesus got through with them, they would be completely sound and restored. We're talking about a Jesus who literally broke all the rules so that he can reach people. 132 people he sat with one-on-one. -on -one. You see, as we're preparing this week, during Passion Week, as we're preparing for Easter, the challenge I've been giving the church is, hey, listen, I'm not telling you go on your social media and, and put a flyer out there and say, hey, if you want to come to church, come with me. No, I'm challenging you to go deeper. Like I preached the first Sunday, I said, you know what? When Jesus looked at Peter and he had a fishing story with him, Peter was told by Jesus, hey, go a little deeper. A little bit deeper is going one-on-one, -on -one, like really going one-on-one. -on -one. I love basketball. Anybody like playing basketball? 
Okay, listen. Wouldn't it look kind of funny if you were at the, at the court and you're like playing basketball, you're dribbling, boom, boom, boom. And, and you're like, you're shooting, but then you run over there and you block your own shot. And, and you're just like, and you're going, you're just running like cray cray all over the place. And, and I, I would, if I saw, I'd be like, oh my God. What, like, you know, you know, there's, there's, you play with someone, right? You know, but how many of us as Christians, we, we, we have made it all about ourselves, and that's what we look like. Look at me. Uh, look what I want to do. Look at my vision. Look at my plan. Look at, we're, it's almost like we're telling Jesus, hey, Jesus, follow me, and then we'll make my dream happen. Hey, Jesus, look at me here. Follow me, and we're going to win souls. No, Jesus said, no, you follow me, and then I'll make you. And while I'm making you, I'll heal you. I'll clean you. I'll restore you. I'll deliver you. I'll lift you up. I'll, I'll, I'll break off all those things in your life, and you watch and see you look different. He said, follow me. But we are living lives. Most Christians are saying, Jesus, no, you follow me. It doesn't work that way. And so he's saying one-on-one. -on -one. That means I spend time with one. I'm going to go out of my way for one person this week. This is Passion Week. If we claim that we, we believe in Christ and we believe in his message of love and hope, then this week... You and I, the church, we have a job to do. And, and, and that's to go out and reach someone. Now listen, whether you bring them on Easter or not, it doesn't matter. The, the, the challenge is you go and fish. You go and reach. You go and touch. You go and, and allow people to experience and encounter God. But we don't just sit back and relax and do nothing. God died. His son died died for you and I to pay for our sins and to give us a hope with a better future. And there are people right now that you and I know, there are people that God has placed in your life at work, people that he's placed in your life as friendships, people that he's placed in your life where you live. It was with his intention that you would reach them. It's not just to say, hey, I work with so-and-so. Hey, I have my neighbor so-and-so. No, God placed you there for a purpose. He placed you there to reach them. He placed you there to heal them. I didn't share this at the, at the 8 or 10, but check this out. I remember when I first moved into my house that I live in now, um, uh, I had this neighbor. It was a couple. And, uh, and I remember, man, I would walk by, and there was always, like, screaming and yelling and just crazy, just, like, like serious stuff. And I'll never forget as I kept seeing it, I'm just like, oh. So I would just walk by and like just try to say, hey, guys, how you doing? Hello. And, you know, not trying to get on their business, kind of like you cray craze, you know. You know, I, they were, obviously they were hurting. And, and I just kept saying, hey, how you doing? Hey, good to see you. The husband would be all ticked off and mad, and he would leave. He didn't give a rip. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> okay. And, and I, just, I just kept going, well, one day it got so bad where, you know, he took off, and she's running, and, and she, then she wants to hurt him. It was just pretty bad. Well, check this out. I, 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 told, I told my wife, hey, we got to go, we got to go uh, talk to the wife because she's just like messed up. She's crying down the hill and she's chasing this guy. He's in the car. She's chasing the car. I'm like, it's crazy. We got to go help. And so we took her and we said, hey, can, can we sit with you? She's like, yeah. And so we, we went to her house to make her feel comfortable. We sat there and she just started just unloading and all the pain and the hurt and the years and years. And you know what? We saw a, 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 a memorial of, of, uh, of witchcraft. Like, we're talking black magic in the corner of a god and everything. And, but supposedly she was a Catholic, you know. But there was like a shrine. And, man, it was kind of freaky. You can literally feel the darkness in the room. And so we just begin to share the love of Christ. And, and she's like, yeah, yeah, I, I believe in God. But obviously, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, but I didn't tell her that. I, I'm just like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's a skeleton right there, right? <laughs> that, that ain't Jesus right there. You know what I'm saying? He, He's got skin on him and, you know, beard and, you know, have you not seen the movie, Pastor Nick? I'm just kidding. But, but it, it's not about dogging. It's about loving. And so we just started sharing Christ. Let me tell you something. We just kept working on her and working on her. This is my neighbor, working on her, working on her. Work. I didn't start like, hi, I'm Pastor Mauricio and I go to Elevate Church. No, just like just your neighbor, working, work. Well, guess what? Eventually she finally came to the understanding who Jesus really was. She received Jesus Christ. Fine. She got a divorce because the situation was pretty bad. Uh, abuse, violence, the whole thing was in the package. But guess what? But she found Christ. She was broken, hurting. We just kept working with her, working with her. Well, let me tell you something. After months, this woman went from deep depression 
to complete healing, restoration, she started attending a church that was Spanish. And, and then she got so up. Listen, to this day now, and I'm sure she would be okay with me sharing her story. She's part of the city council of Santa Clarita. Okay. She goes to a church that she serves, and now she's one of the leaders. And now through her own business, she does all kinds of rallies through her business, and she's always teaching business, but she's always winning souls. You see, God is just looking for a lure, someone with a scent. Remember I talked about scent last week? You know what? When I go fishing, I don't just take one bait. I take several baits. Why? Because you know what? You just never know what the game's going to be like. And so you got to switch it up. So sometimes I take, you know what, I take lures like, you know, like this big bad boy, you know. Woo, right, I love this one. You know, I just take, di I, di I take different kind that uh, they do different things for the job. And this is one of my favorite ones. And uh, I've caught so many bass with this kind. Um, but then there's times where you just know hey, nothing's working. So now what you do, you bring the stank out. And it's called power bait. And power bait, uh, they, they're different colors. And they have different looks, but there's also kind of with different scents. And it's amazing how not every fish attacks or attracts, you know, it, every single fish. But it does attract the right kind of fish that like that kind of food. And so there's times where I'll cast out a, a, a power bait, different colors. I got rainbow. I got white. I got orange. I got red. I got all kinds of colors. I'll put it on there. I'll cast it out there. And you know, here's how it works. The fish, they go up and the scent attracts. Everybody say attract. So remember the three points. Number one, a skilled fisherman first must have presentation. It's all about presentation. So whenever I cast out my lure, I got to have some really cool presentation that says, oh, you're legit. I'm going to eat you. Right? But then after presentation, you have to be attractive. Right? It's gotta, there's got to be something about you that says, I want to know the God that you serve. And so all of a sudden, you know what I do? I add what's called the scent bait. And you know what the scent bait does? The scent bait literally starts attracting the smell of something delicious. And so the fish come, and here, I've gotten so good at my fishing that I know when a fish takes and when a fish spits out. And so, you know what? When something doesn't work, the scent didn't work, it spits it out, I lose the fish. But when it, when it works, oh, you can feel the pull. It's like clank, and that's it. I pull that baby in, and it's awesome. But check this out. You as a believer have a scent. And you either stank or you smell good. You see, people every single day are looking at you, and you're either attractive with your, with your walk with God or you're not. What do I mean by that? Listen, I have met Christians that they, I mean, I've sat with them and they say, I'm a Christian too, like really great. And then the moment they open their mouth, it doesn't line up with what they're saying. It's like flappity, flap, flap. And it's like, whoa, you're not a Christian. You're, help me Jesus, you know. And, and, and so it's like, it looked the part. <laughs> it smelled like a Christian. It looked like a Christian. But the moment they started talking, it didn't taste like a Christian. And so what happens is, is that, you know what? There's people that they do, they get attracted, and then you open your mouth and you start saying things that don't line up with God. Like God will never start gossiping about somebody. <laughs> so guess what? The moment you gossip, guess what? You stank. The moment you start, you start dividing people, guess what? You stank. The moment you start holding uh, uh, forgiveness from someone, everyone deserves forgiveness. I mean, you deserve forgiveness. Why doesn't other people deserve forgiveness? We stank. Now, do they deserve for us to be, you know, BFFs and hang out? No, but you stank. And so there's a scent from heaven. God gives you and I a scent. When you spend time in God's presence, God places a scent of heaven on you. And that sense, that presence of God begins to transform your life from the inside out. There has to be some kind of fruit that says, I have been with God. There has to be something that says in your life that, you know what, me and God, we're connected. There's a relationship with God that my life has changed so much that people are just wondering, how did you do that now? Because I want what you have. I'm struggling with what you used to struggle with, and I need what you have. There's a scent to every believer. And you carry that scent wherever you go. The question is, is do people go ahead and, ah, like they grab, like, yes. Because Jesus said, listen, I go fishing. I gave you an acronym for fishing. Check this out. Fish. F is for focus. I. I is for in our. Focus in our. S. C of. H. Humanity. So focus in our sea of humanity. Jesus came with a focus. 
a big picture. He came for a sea of humanity. That is his focus. You know what I'm saying? He loved the world so much that he literally put his entire focus solely on the people that God wanted him to die for and give them a new life. That's what we're supposed to do. When we go fishing, we focus in our sea of humanity. Are you hearing me today? Why? Because Jesus did it. Look at Luke chapter uh, 19 verse 10. Look what it says. Look, this was his focus. It says, the son of man came to what? Find lost people and what? And save them. I mean, so when Jesus came, he literally just said, hey, uh, follow me. Boom. For what? We're going to go find some lost people. Why? Because we're going to save them. So when he says, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men, God's saying, hey, follow me and we're going to go save some people. We're going to go rescue some people. We're going to go cast some lines. You know why it's so important to fish, guys? Because Satan is fishing also. He's the competitor. Satan is fishing your friends. Satan is fishing your family. Satan is fishing your coworkers, and he's working them. But he's fishing them with lust, with anger, with pride, with envy, you know, with, with, with uh, uh, idols and all kinds of things. And he's fishing them. But though Satan is the caster of disaster, my Jesus is the master caster. We have an advantage point. When we fish with Jesus, we trump whatever the enemy is bringing into whoever's life. Why? Because God makes us more attracted because of his scent. All we have to do now is make sure that what's coming out of our mouth is attractive. Right? For example, like if someone's going through something, Sogo was going through some family things. It was like, oh, wow, Sogo, I'm so sorry. Layla's going through that. Wow. Well, you know what, um, wow. You know, well, okay. Uh, all right, just keep us posted, okay? No, it was like, no, heck no. Here's what's going to happen. Bam, bam, bam. We're going to pray. We're going to believe. Something's going to change. Things are going to happen. That's attractive. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That's what Jesus wants. So when, when Satan is casting his, 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 his casting of disaster, you know what? Jesus is the master caster. And he comes in and he starts changing situations and circumstances. And then people are like, whoa, I want that. Do you know that people, most people will, will go with you and hear you because all they're waiting for is for someone just to ask them? They're just waiting for you and I just to say, hey, listen, I, I know the answer to your problem and his name is Jesus and, and here's how we can do it. And then all of a sudden people are like, whoa. Most people are, are interested, honestly, especially during Easter, to go to church. After Easter, not so much. It's interesting. But during Easter, like if you start inviting one-on-one -on -one with people, you're like, hey, you know what? I really want you to go to church with me. Come with me, okay? I'll meet you there. I'll take you to lunch. I'll take you to whatever. Uh, they'll come. It, listen, your friends are worth a meal. Buy them a meal. Encourage them. Say, let's go. Because if not, here's what happens. We probably forgot what we were saved from. I mean, think about it. Who was the person that fished for you? Can you think of the person that fished for you? The person that went out of their way for you? How many here, and I've been doing this all day, and it's been the same number, 90% of people here uh, came to church because someone invited them here. How about 12 o'clock? How many here um, came to Christ because of a person fishing for you, loving on you? Lift your hand if that's you. Lift it high, please. Help me out. Okay, that's awesome. That's 90% of you. How many came to Elevate Church because someone invited you to Elevate Church? Lift your hand. 90%. That's what it's been all day long. Listen, it's not social media for us. It's not cool graphics, which we have the bomb graphics here. It's not cool, you know, videos that we have, which we do have cool videos. It's none of that. People come because someone went fishing for them. People come because they trusted you to come here. They didn't trust me. They trusted you. And they come for you. And therefore, when they come for you, then they, then they experience him. That's how that works. We are to fish. It is God's desire that we go out and we fish. Where's my iPad? Here it is. Jesus said, fish. Look at this. Matthew 14, 31. I love this. It says, right away, Jesus reached out. Everybody say, right away. Right away. Look, right away, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. Everybody say, caught him. Right. And he was all about catching people. Catching fish, and he caught him. What's the story here? Let's just, let's just talk about it. This is the story where Peter, remember when Peter's walking on water? 
So he's like walking on water and he's like, whoa, this is cool. And he's looking at Jesus as he's walking on water, right? But what happens? As he's walking on water, he starts having a little bit of doubt, right? He ticks his eyes off Jesus. You know what? It's not just lost people that are broken. Christians are broken. And he, and he takes his eyes off Jesus. And you know what begins to happen? He sinks, but Jesus immediately reaches out and he, he lifts him out and he catches him before he sinks. And he says to him, your faith is so small, Peter. He said, why did you doubt me? But isn't that cool that even when you're sinking, that Jesus will save you first and then talk to you about it? That's grace. That God would be willing to save you first, not see you drowning and be like, you see, I told you. I done told you that if you would have just kept your eyes on me. I told you if you would have just done what I told you. No, he he, he reached out his and he caught them. You see, here's the truth. Your job is just to go fishing. God's job is to clean them. The pressure is not on you. The pressure is on God. We don't go to people and we're like, man, you need to stop that sin because, you know, that sin's going to kill you. It's gonna, nobody wants to hear that. You know what? I don't know about you, but the way, the way I came to Christ is that Christ loved me to death. We have the greatest gospel. The gospel is the hook. What's the hook? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have the most awesome bait. What's the bait? Jesus. Jesus is the one who's attractive. Jesus is awesome. When we are unfaithful, he remains faithful all the time. He's so good. So Jesus grabs him and he catches him. That's what God wants us to do because there are people right now that you and I know that right now are drowning in despair. There are people right now that you and I know that are drowning in misery, in, in depression. There are people that are drowning with doubt and fears. There's nothing wrong with doubt, guys. There's nothing wrong. Why is it that the church gets a little weird when people have doubt about God? Listen, that's why he gave us faith because faith will always trump doubt. There's nothing wrong with doubt. Don't get, don't get upset or freaked out if someone says, well, I don't believe in that. That's okay. Remember when you probably didn't have the strongest faith, when you didn't really believe that God was going to heal you or provide those finances or reach your family, but he did it anyways. And so there are people right now that need to be caught, not talked to, but caught, and then God will talk to them. And we, we reach them. We help them. We bring them out of their drowning, and we say, God, we use my life to save some people. Are you with me today? I know this is a very confronting message, but we have to. We have to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must reach people. It's Passion Week. Jesus was passionate about giving his life for the gospel. When you're hooked on something, I've told you, this is my togiak. Like, I've been wanting to go fishing all week long. But it's a prop. I can't. Can't even use my own you know, togiak right there. But I promise you, as soon as we're done with this whole, you know, series, I'm going to go fishing on that togiak. I'm going to catch me some fish. Why? I, I'm hooked on I like fishing. I super enjoy it. When you're hooked on something, you make time for it. Jesus was willing to give his time, but also his life for you and me. Come on, you have a fishing story with God. Everyone has a fishing story if you're a believer. But there are people right now that are literally going through some natural stuff. You know why? Because Satan is always hooking people with natural disasters. He's the caster of disaster. You know what he does? He goes ahead and he causes a natural thing. Like Layla, that wasn't God. God didn't put sickness on her. You know, there's things right now that are happening in this world. You know what? Satan is the one who does those things. He's the influence of some really wicked, dark stuff. But you know what? But God can take dark stuff and he can turn it around and make it light and use it for something greater. Jesus is doing super on your natural right now. That's what he's doing. She was on Wednesday night coming here with some natural problems, and then we all showed up, and then God put his super on his natural. We had a supernatural move of God, and now Layla's doing awesome. We got to remember that. Satan is always doing things to bring destruction. Even Jesus said in John 10, 10, he says the thief does not come except to what? Steal, kill, destroy. I mean, how much more information do we need? He was pretty clear because when we start talking about like natural things, I think that we're more focused on drama. You know what I'm saying? And trauma of people instead of realizing that there's an underlying influence. For example, I mean, think about it. Satan comes to steal, kill, destroy, but Jesus said, but I came to give life, and I love how he ends it. I want them to have it in the fullest possible 
way. There is an enemy. There is a devil, and he hates you. The reason we go fishing is because he's fishing for people, and he wants to destroy them, and he wants to kill them. We go fishing because we bring life. Listen, Satan, he brings people from life to death. Jesus, he brings people from death to life. But it happens through you and me. It's so shocking. Do you guys remember the first week when I preached? You remember that big fishbowl I brought in here? Do you guys remember when I took out a fish out of the water? And I took the fish and I put it on the table and I was just like, yeah. And all you, <gasps> everyone, like the whole church all day, I had people freaking out all day long. Like I had some weird stuff happen that Sunday. People were so upset. And I'm just thinking, wow, you have more conviction over a goldfish being out of its natural environment, but you're looking at your friends, your family, your coworkers. You know they're going to hell. You're saved, but they're going to hell, and you have no reaction. We have more reaction over a fish <gasps> than we do people that are going to hell. Why won't we have that kind of reaction for lost people? But we do for goldfish. I got people wasting their time emailing me stupid stuff. Like, you shouldn't have done that. They're my fish. I bought them. I do whatever I want with my fish. <laughs> when you paid for it, then open your mouth. Like, why don't you use that typing energy, and why don't you go invite someone to Jesus? I know. I, it's like, you serious? Why? Jesus didn't die for goldfish. He died for souls. Goldfish is fine. It's my fish. It's at home, okay? I'll send, I'll send a little picture from Instagram so you all see that he's alive. But it's so true. It's amazing how many people, they get so weirded out over pets. I love pets. I've had two dogs. I got my big dog, Bear. I love him. You know, we got our goldfish. You know? Yeah, I brought it out, but I brought it back to life. That's what you do. You bring, people, you bring people from death and you put them back in life. That's what we do. That's what we do. Your fishbowl is your workplace. And there are people that are gasping for air right now. And they need you. Are you with me? Good, good, good. When you think about how you were reached, you start thinking a little bit more compassion. It's so amazing what God does. Because, listen, the devil is real. I mean, if he's not real, when people get weird about the devil, I think you have to bring him back to reality. I mean, think about this. How do you explain child pornography? Oh, nobody here, no one in this world can point the finger at the one who started that. How do you explain racism? People get so caught up on the people that are creating racism, and they forget. We're talking about Christians here, okay, Christians. We forget there's someone deeper that started this whole racial thing. And his name is Satan. He's a divider. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. And then he uses people to influence him to do his work. It's an evil, crooked, dark world that has all hell backing it up. And I think as Christians, we forget that. And we just want to look at individuals and play the game of accusing that person and that color and that age and that culture. Here's the deal, man. This has been happening. Racism has been happening since the beginning. But it's the enemy who influences this, and then people get caught up in it. That's why we, the church, have to have the power that God has given us to come in and pierce darkness through our everlasting light, and his name is Jesus. It is the light. I have met with people that have been racial, but I've been able to reach them with love with compassion, because I wonder who abused them. I wonder, I wonder who molested them. I wonder who did what to them, because now all that experience, all that trauma in life, it was what basically began to shape and form their anger, their hate, their, their destructive ways. And I think if we start thinking like Jesus, we start thinking, wow, you know what, God, use me a little bit more so I can reach that person that's so far away from you. Challenge me, God, because it's easy to love people and reach people that love you, but it's hard to reach people that are unlovely. No one makes a time or a day for people that, 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 that are hating. Haters are going to hate. They hated Jesus, they're going to hate you. The question is, what kind of Jesus are you going to be? The real one or the fake one? Amen? It's a quiet Pentecostal church this afternoon. So quiet. 
Think about it. Let, let's bring it personal now. What about my lust, your lust? What about your envy, my envy? What about your pride, my pride? Where do you think that comes from? Do you think you did that? No. Satan worked you. He worked me. See, but we don't talk like that, right? You see, we got to go deeper. And we have to come to the, to the idea that there's an enemy, an adversary. And you know what? And we have to compete because he's casting always, but he's casting a line of disaster. And we're going to cast a line of life. Jesus is all about life. He's about saving. He's about rescuing. And I think when you start realizing what you and I were rescued from, I think you start having a little bit more compassion for people. You start thinking, you know what, maybe they're that way because, and then you finish the sentence. What if you just had a little bit more compassion to think, just maybe, maybe that's why they're acting like that. That's a whole other level. That's real Christian stuff right there. <laughs> Look at this. I'm almost done. Give me like seven more minutes. I'll be done. Listen. This was an issue for the early church. James, the brother, the young brother of Jesus, was now speaking to the churches. And they were having an issue with Christianity back then. But I love how the scripture, how the word of God has been so relevant 2,000 years later. I mean, James knew that, that we would have this issue at Elevate Church, at every church in the, around the world that he's having. And he's so prophetic that he puts in this verse in here to challenge the church to think a little bit more different. When you read the Bible, think this way. You're not reading history. You're reading a prophetic message for you today. When you come here and you hear the word of God, it is a message that is confronting you. When you read the Bible, it's really reading you. It's checking your heart. And so look what James says. James chapter 1 verse 26, I mean 22, it says, do not merely listen. Everybody say merely listen. You see, I think there's so many of us in Christianity, okay, that, that go to church merely only, that word merely means only to listen. And so we listen and we hear amazing messages because I know that at Elevate Church, you, whoever's on this, on this pulpit, whoever's speaking from here is always getting a message from heaven. I know that when you come here and you worship, you're always experiencing God. You know what? I know that when you come here and you're meeting with children or youth, everyone's always being touched by God. And so James is saying, hey, listen, Elevate Church, don't merely listen to the word. And so what? Deceive yourselves. Do you know that when you make it solely about you, you've already deceived yourself? Like when you're so caught up in your opinion, when you're so caught up on your ideas, do you know that that is already like the worst deception? It's called self-deception. Well, you've already deceived yourselves. You've, you've just listened and listened and listened. But, but, but James is like realizing that the church, the church is a little bit messed up in the way they think. And he says, hey, listen, guys, don't merely listen. If James was preaching to elevate church today, he would preach this message much more powerful than I would. But he said it, hey, stop just listening. But do what it says. Do what it says. And it's true because, you know what, I think that sometimes, you know what, we can be that type of Christian where we go to church solely to get credit from God. Like, God, I went to church today. As if he's in heaven, like, oh, my God, look at Modis who's in church. <laughs> Guys, look, angels, come here. My son, my girl, they went to church today. Oh, my God, yay. You know, or as if, as if like the angels are coming like, hey, God, come here, come here. Look at Denise. Look what Denise is doing. What is she doing? Look, look she's worshiping. Okay. Yeah, but look how she's doing it. She's raising her palms up on Palm Sunday. No, it's just like it doesn't work that way. No, if not, you're just coming just for the fact to make yourself feel better about you. Listen, I'm all for feel better about you, but when will you get over you and make it about others? That's what James is saying. Hey, too many of us, we're just coming and we're just listening. We're listening, we're listening, we're listening. Man, great, great tagline. Oh, great, 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 great little saying. Great this, great that. But when does the doing part come in? James is saying, don't just listen. 
do it. And then if you really read it in the, in the bigger context of James, you know what he was really talking about? That when you're just listening and listening and listening, he, he, he likens you and me to like a man or a woman who goes to the mirror, they look at themselves, they know who they are, they walk away and they forget who they were. When you don't do what God has asked you to do, you clearly forget who you are in Christ. You clearly forget your identity in Christ. And the enemy will give you a new identity. But when you're doing it, it's like me. Listen, you cannot convince me that there is no God. Why? I've been doing this for 20 years, guys. I've seen God's miracles, signs, and wonders. No one is going to tell me there is no God. I have tasted and I have seen the goodness of God, and nothing and no one can ever change my mind. If everybody at Elevate Church would stop raising their hands and worshiping God, I would be the only one lifting my hands and seeking him, worshiping, shouting, going crazy. Why? Because you know what? I've already experienced him, and nothing's going to change that. But that's 20 years of doing. Doing. We cannot just listen. You cannot do that. James, is he's up in our grill. And he's saying, hey, listen. Yeah, you're very knowledgeable in the word. But which one do you live? You know the scriptures real well, but which one are you living right now? Because it ain't lining up. Can we get an amen on that one? Okay, amen on that one. That's not a no me. That's a amen. Are you with me? Okay. Look at this. Here's why. Look, James 1.25, he says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. Everybody say it gives freedom. You see, when, when, you, when you are now intentional in growing in the word of God, it brings freedom to your life. When you stop being intentional about seeking God, you're bound again with your stuff. Have you noticed people that go back or default back to their old ways? You know why that is? Because they stop being intentional about God. That's the only reason. And he says it here. And then he says, and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but what? Like, I'm not talking about forgetting. I'm talking about, did you do it? Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you what? But are you doing it? But are you doing it? And then he says, hey, listen, uh, they will be blessed in what they, why will you be blessed? Because I'm not only a listener, I do it. And then God says, I'll bless that. You see, there is such thing as man's gift and God, listen, God has given all of you gifts and don't let the gift deceive you. Because your gift can always shine, but that just doesn't mean that God's all over it. Y'all didn't want to hear that. Sorry. <laughs> I love this verse. Can I give you two more verses? First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.12 says, says this. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength to do what? To do it. See, so not only did he provide the word, he provided the fire. It's like, he's like, I gave you the wood <laughs> and I light it too. I gave you the strength to do it. He says, he considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Do you know that when I fish, I always bring my trustworthy baits, always. You know, when you're fishing, sometimes you just have a horrible day of fishing. And so I always bring the game changer, the trustworthy. This one has never failed me. And, you know, it may not be the fish I want, but, hey, at least I don't want to skunk, right? And so you start casting this down. Well, God's saying, hey, listen, I know that you're my trustworthy bait that I can cast. When, when this person fails and doesn't want to do what I'm asking them to do, it's okay, I got another lure. When this person doesn't do what they're supposed to do, it's okay, I got another one. When this person doesn't do what they want to do, I got another one. Don't you let God skip you. Don't be called Skippy in heaven. I want to be trustworthy and say, Father, you said you put me in the ministry. Now use me. Amen. And so it's so important. Okay, so there are two things that are happening right now, okay? Uh, right now, number one, we either go from attract to distract. Or number two, we're going from attract to what? Okay, so right now, right now in this very moment, right now, you're either attracting people only to distract them. As a believer. Like, like you can be the Christian that's working with people, but you're so distracting with the way you live. 
or how you talk. Or you're the one that is attracting, come on, there's the scent, but then there's the react. Do people react to that love? What do I mean by that? I need like two women and two guys that are bold, that, man, you're just like, you're bomb.com. You're just amazing and you know it and you're not being prideful. You just know that, man, I'm confident. Can I get two guys? Let's start with two guys. Can I get two guys? Any, any, any volunteer guys? There's not one man that's, oh, thank you, finally. <laughs> about to say there's no men in Elevate Church. Wow, okay. Thank you. Stand back there. Okay, yeah, come on here, Kurt. Two ladies now. Come on, let me see. See, the women are always awesome. Come over here. here. Right over here. Right over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's good. You guys can mix up whatever you like. Check this out. Quickly, please. Just bring me the whole thing. The, The whole tray. Check this out. No, wrong tray. Where's the, where's the? <laughs> There's this game called Bean Boozled. Has anyone ever played Bean Boozled? Okay, Bean Boozled, as we're celebrating Passion Week, as we're preparing for Easter weekend, here's what happens. This game, basically, you kind of like flip the little arrow, and then it lands on a jelly bean, which is awesome. But the difference between a legit jelly bean and this jelly bean is this, is that these jelly beans are optional. What I mean by optional? They have two flavors. This one right here, it says caramel corn or moldy cheese. This one says chocolate pudding or canned dog food. This one is butter popcorn or rotten egg. This one says juicy pear or booger. Now, a lot of you... A lot, of you, a lot of you still eat your boogers. So don't even act like, oh, my God. Ooh, this is disgusting. Mm. <laughs> Strawberry banana smoothie or dead fish? Berry blue or toothpaste? Lime or lawn clippings? Peach or barf? Have you ever tried barf? <laughs> Let me see all my hangover people days. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Tutti fruity or stinky socks? And so, and so. All day today, I said, you know what, in celebration, celebration of Passion Week, let's go ahead and let's have some, let's, let's have some, some, some jelly beans. And so um, I want you all just to pick one, one thing. Don't do, no, don't do nothing with it. Just pick one, pick one. Anyone quickly, please, quickly. Thank you. And here's what happens. Inside these little cups is a jelly bean. It's one of those that we just talked about. Now, um, I hope you have strong gag reflexes. <laughs> Because if you get one of those, is nasty, okay? So I want each one of you to, uh, in a moment, I'll call you one by one. You'll put it in your mouth, and then I want you to chew it, and then take your gum out so that you know the flavor of that. Um, let me have some tissue, guys. Somebody give me some tissue. And that way you can tell us. You can put your gum in there. That's why she's giving you that. There you go. Uh, and I'll take that from you. And you tell us what flavor you think it may be, okay? Now, I had the, the anointing of good at the 10 o'clock. Everybody got a good jelly bean. And I was like, dang. <laughs> so I started praying, I'm like, God, please, 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 God. The 12 o'clock, just let them barf. Like, we need to deliver us. Like, bring it back. You know, so I'm just praying that today we're going to see some stuff. But so, so we'll start with you. Go ahead and try it and taste it. And then just tell me what flavor it is. Is it good or is it, like, nasty? And see if you can just put it in there. See, because at first, at first, you can't even tell. Oh, <laughs> What is it? What is it? It's barb. (laughs) Yes, thank you, Lord. That's awesome. Okay, finish eating it. No, finish eating it. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, how about yours? Is that a good one or a bad one? What is it? Stinky (laughs) sog. Okay, how about yours? God is so good. He answers my prayers. Look at that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> What's it taste like? I don't know. Mud? It's probably dog food. I love it. Dog food? How about yours? My chances of being good. Okay, go. Let's go. Well, no. Was it, no, is it good or bad? No. <laughs> go ahead. Give them a big hand. You guys can all be seated, please. Hey, listen, listen, what's the whole point of this? Listen, you as a Christian, you, you can look good. You can look good. 
you, you can, you can uh, not only look good, but, but as, as people come to you, you can have the scent of heaven. And, and like, oh, whoa. But, but, but the moment that, that you and I begin to speak into the lives of people, you know what? You can begin to look good, smell good, but as we put you in our mouth or as people put you in their mouth, as they begin to catch your flavor from heaven or hell. <laughs> uh, see, at first when they all started, it's very deceiving because when you first put it in, there's no flavor until you, until you start chewing. And isn't it interesting how God says, I start with milk, but at some point I give you meat to chew on. And after a while, you've been safe for so many years, but when people chew on you, hopefully it's mmm, or it's like mmm. It's like, it's like James said, don't, do not merely listen. Do it. Because when you're just listening, I promise you that your taste is not that great. Because he's the only one that can add flavor to your life. He said, you're the light of the world and you are the what? Salt of the earth. He brings flavor to your life. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.